Okay, everyone, welcome. On behalf of the West Virginia University College of Law, it is my pleasure to say welcome to you to this John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine. This endowed lecture is another of our Dean's Enrichment Series, which consists primarily of lectures featuring prominent legal academics and practitioners who make presentations in their areas of expertise. And by sharing their expertise, they help us all to increase and deepen our knowledge, uh, which is what legal education is and should be all about. The John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine was established through the generosity of uh, Dr. Thomas S. Clark and Jean Clark, and it is part of the Clark Family Lecture Series here at WVU, which is funded by a half million dollar pledge that was made in 1998. The pledge supports 10 lectures in fields of study throughout the university, and we're proud to have this event as our part of the lecture series. The interdisciplinary nature of this lecture is both timely and appropriate, uh, because the fields of law and of medicine have so much overlap, and both face so much uncertainty right now. Healthcare options, uh, both in types of delivery and services, are rapidly changing in our state and our nation and the world. And our state of West Virginia has deep needs uh, and deep challenges in the areas of law and medicine. And this lecture series is just one part uh, of helping to develop and expand the dialogue on these critically important topics. And it is highly appropriate that the lecture series is named after John W. Fisher II, who was a member of the College of Law faculty from 1968 until 2014, and who served as the Dean of the College of Law for 10 years. Dean Fisher retired in 2014, and he is the William J. Mayer, Jr. Dean Emeritus and the Robert M. Steptoe and James D. Steptoe Professor of Property Law Emeritus. And his countless contributions to the College of Law, the legal profession, and the state of West Virginia are indicative of the College of Law's continued and distinguished um, legacy of service. So I am proud, uh, like so many others here at the College of Law, to call him my friend, uh, my mentor, and my colleague. And I am now pleased uh, to introduce to you our own healthcare law expert and an important member of our faculty, Professor Valerie Blake. Uh, Professor Blake will introduce our speaker for this year's John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I have been told to um, announce a few housekeeping items first. Um, so our speaker has been made aware that many of you have class at 1 o'clock. Um, so she will plan on wrapping up around 12.55. She knows this. And you can make your mass exodus to class. Um, I think it's con law, right? Yeah? No? OK. Um, Okay, uh, there will be a reception right out in the hall um, directly after for those of you who can attend. So I am honored that Professor Crosley can join us to deliver the annual John W. Fisher Lecture in Law and Medicine. Professor Crosley is a leading national expert in matters of both healthcare law and disability law. She is currently a professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, where she served as the dean at my tenure there um, she was there from 2005 to 2012 as their dean. Um, prior to teaching at Pitt, she um, has taught at both Florida State University and at University of California Hastings College of Law. Professor Crosley teaches in a diverse number of areas, including health law, bioethics, family law, torts, and legislation and regulation. Her scholarship is as wide ranging as it is well regarded. I cite her almost every time I write a paper, as do most others in our field. Um, her scholarship focuses broadly on inequality in the financing and delivery of healthcare. And it includes topics like physician bias in medical treatment, health insurance discrimination against the unhealthy, and disability rights of newborns. She has many honors. Um, let me just give you a couple. Uh, in 2013, she was named the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation public health law scholar in residence, which is a very big deal. Um, and in 2016, she was elected to the American Law Institute. Before teaching, Professor Crosley practiced corporate and healthcare law and clerked for Judge Harry Welford of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, a Tennessee girl. She is a JD from Vanderbilt and a BA from the University of, of Virginia. Um, on a personal note, 
I owe Professor Crosley an enormous debt of gratitude. She has been a mentor of mine over the years and has lent me syllabi, uh, taken time to give me notes on papers. Um, she's a wonderful colleague and friend to those who have the pleasure of working with her. Uh, with that, I'll let her come up to the podium and begin. Thank you. That, I think, was the nicest introduction I've ever been given. So thank you. Um, and it's really a real honor um, to be here today and to be giving the Fisher Lecture in Law and Medicine. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Dean Fisher last night and having dinner with him. And I am truly honored to be giving a lecture in his name um, for someone who has given so much to this great institution. For me, one of the real pleasures of writing and teaching in the field of healthcare law is that I end up reading medical journal articles because, not necessarily because they're really fun or because I understand everything that's in them, but in order to gain insights and ideas into how medical professionals view the world and what kind of issues they're facing because often those issues have legal angles. And I find it interesting because it's a little bit, for me, like being a traveler in a strange land because I get to learn the different language and the customs and the perspectives before getting to retreat into my own kind of familiar country of the law. And so I thought I'd start today by sharing with you a couple of medical journal articles that I've read recently since they relate to the topic that I'm going to be speaking about. The first is an editorial published in the New England Journal of Medicine at the end of January, Allocating Organs to Cognitively Impaired Patients. It describes a letter that 30 members of Congress sent to the Federal Department of Health and Human Services asking it to issue guidance on organ transplant discrimination against people with disabilities. The letter was prompted by recent high-profile cases where transplant centers excluded persons with cognitive impairment, impairments from transplant waiting lists. The second article is a short research piece published last October in the journal JAMA Internal Medicine. Its title is States Worse Than Death Among Hospitalized Patients with Serious Illnesses. This article reported the results of a study in which the researchers asked hospitalized patients with serious illnesses about a series of conditions, or what they called states of debility, and how the patients would compare having those conditions to being dead on a scale that ranged from being worse than being dead to being much better than being dead. Turns out that while fewer than 10% thought that using a wheelchair would be worse than or the same as death, nearly 70% thought that relying on a breathing machine or being incontinent would be the same as or worse than being dead. So that gives you some idea of the kinds of medical journals that articles that catch my eye. And I'll come back to these later in my lecture to tie them into what I'm um, talking about today. And what I'm going to be talking about today is looking at how and why the perspectives of people with disabilities challenge mainstream understandings of end-of-life decision-making. Now, I may seem to be an odd choice to offer the disability perspective on this or, for that matter, any other topic, as I am an able-bodied and a person of sound mind, um, at least for the moment. For the past 30 years, though, I've puzzled over how people with disabilities experience the healthcare system and how the healthcare system experiences people with disabilities. Either I'm not very good at this sort of puzzle, or it's a really tough puzzle, or maybe a little bit of both. In any event, I'm still struggling with these questions. And the topic continues to engage me because, to my mind, understanding what it means to be disabled is an inextricable part of what it means to be human. In this lecture, I should be clear, I do not speak for people with disabilities. People with disabilities are able to speak for themselves. I'm simply offering my understanding of views commonly expressed by members of the disability community. My starting premise is that disability lies at the heart of questions about what I call 
ending life decisions, simply because most people whose lives end as a result of a decision to withhold or terminate life-sustaining um, life medical treatment or to seek active medical assistance in dying are, in fact, disabled. Some may have become disabled only at the very end of their lives, while others may have been disabled for many years or for their entire lives. But my point is that, by and large, discussions about the right to die have not been about able-bodied, mentally competent persons. Our society remains profoundly uncomfortable with the idea that an able-bodied, healthy person would voluntarily direct her own death. But there's something about infirmity and the loss of function and independence, sometimes, but not always, coupled with the conviction that death is just around the corner anyway, that makes the decision to go ahead and die or let die be deemed acceptable. Now, I'm not arguing that this judgment, whether just kind of intuitive or the product of moral reasoning, I'm not arguing that it's necessarily wrong. But I am convinced that disability, or the fear of disability, is nearly always part of the ending life calculus, whether it's acknowledged or not. The 40th anniversary of the Karen Ann Quinlan case prompted me to reflect on disability perspectives on medical decisions at the end of life. As you may recall, the Quinlan case was a brown, groundbreaking case in which the New Jersey Supreme Court permitted the family of a young woman in a persistent vegetative state to disconnect her ventilator, thus permitting her death. Over the past four decades since Quinlan, the steady arc of end-of-life law has been towards liberalization of choices by and for patients who are se severely compromised or near the end of their lives. Many leading thinkers and activists in the disability community, however, have questioned that liberalization. Now, disability has not been entirely absent from this conversation within bioethics and medicine and law, what I'll refer to as kind of the mainstream community about the acceptability of death hastening medical decisions. But at times, disability has been viewed as an interloper, an uninvited guest to the party, or perhaps the guest whom the host felt obliged to invite but whose presence wasn't entirely welcome. My sense is that physicians, bioethicists, and lawyers have sometimes experienced disability advocates' concerns as marginal, if not bordering on the paranoid, or perhaps subject to manipulation by other interest groups. Disability concerns may be perceived as distracting attention from broadly held values and interfering with progress. As a result, Discussions about ending life decisions within the mainstream community and the disability community have often proceeded on parallel tracks without directly engaging one another. And my view is that because most ending life decisions are made for people with disabilities, that group must be at the center of conversations about the meaning of and limits on those decisions. So today, I'm going to do two things. First, I'll briefly describe disability concerns about the liberalization of ending life decisions, summarizing the reasons for the apprehension that many in that community experience surrounding treatment termination and physician-aided dying. Then, I'll go ahead and um, consider how recent conversations about racial justice issues in policing and criminal justice promoted by the Black Lives Matter movement, among others, might offer some parallels to the concerns of disability advocates. And to my mind, these parallels help explain the concerns of disability activists and reveal them as deeply imbued with social justice um, commitments. Now, I should start by emphasizing that people with disabilities have diverse views on these questions, right? So there's not a single viewpoint. Although the perspective on ending life decisions held by the disability community are distinctive, it's not a monolithic view. And that makes sense because much of the experience of living with a communication disorder differs from that of living with blindness or with an anxiety disorder 
or with quadriplegia or with an intellectual disability. The experience widely shared by people with diverse disabilities, however, is that of being excluded, socially isolated, devalued, and dismissed by the dominant culture and the physical, social, and economic structures it builds. Though shared experiences provide the foundation on which disability studies scholars, disability rights organizations, and disability activists build their work. At its core, much of the concerns that the disability community expresses regarding end-of-life decision-making flows from a lack of trust and confidence that all the persons and institutions involved in those decisions will respect the experiences, values, and welfare of people with disabilities. In the lived experience of many people with disabilities, there, there are a lot of different, what I think of as strands of concern that are woven together to create a fabric of profound unease about some of these decisions. And so we have the fabric on the slide, but I'm gonna try to pick it out strand by strand to try to describe some of those concerns for you. Historical examples abound of instances where physicians, public health officials, and government programs have discriminated against, abused, and isolated people with disabilities all too often with society sanction. The pictures from this Hall of Fame, oh, I'm sorry, Hall of Shame, I should say, are familiar. There's the photo of Carrie Buck, who like more than 60,000 other Americans who were believed to be feeble-minded, disabled, or otherwise unfit to reproduce, was sterilized without her consent, all in the, all in the name of eugenic vision of public health that endured from the 1920s until well after the end of the Second World War. The Supreme Court upheld Virginia's eugenic sterilization law with Justice Holmes' ringing endorsement that three generations of imbeciles are enough. The disturbing images from the 1960s and 70s of disabled youth in wretched conditions in the Willowbrook State School in New York also come to mind. For decades, Decades, physicians were complicit in the history of mistreatment of people with disabilities, including involuntary institutionalization and forced medical procedures. Willowbrook, with its history of abuses of and experimentation on children and youth with intellectual disabilities, is symbolic of physician mistreatment of disabled people, much as the Tuskegee syphilis study is for black people. In the 1980s, the public became aware of another example of physicians supporting death-dealing decisions for vulnerable people with disabilities. Significant media attention focused on the story of Baby Doe, an infant born with Down syndrome, whose parents chose not to authorize routine surgery to correct an esophageal blockage and instead permitted their infant to die of starvation. Baby Doe was not an isolated case. So-called selective non-treatment for disabled newborns was described in one medical journal article of the time as the highest form of medical ethic, and surveys showed significant physician support for the practice. For decades, systemic government-sanctioned practices isolated people with disabilities in institutions where they had little or no opportunity to participate in community life or to pursue educational or economic opportunities. The societal stigma attached to disability contributed to and reinforced Medicaid's preference for institution-based long-term care services, which required people with disabilities to live in institutions in order to be able to receive needed supportive and medical services. It wasn't until 1999 that the Supreme Court's decision in Olmstead versus Zimring recognized that in cases where institutionalization is unnecessary and undesired, a state's failure to provide services in a community-based setting constitutes disability discrimination in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Despite Olmstead, though, Medicaid's historic structural bias in favor of institutional care persists. Although allocation of Medicaid funding varies from state to state, in 2013, more than 30 states still devoted less than half 
of their long-term care spending to home and community-based services as opposed to institutional care. Even today, many offices of physicians and other health care providers seem to be in some kind of land of that time forgot when it comes to accessibility for people with disabilities. The New York Times recently described a study in which a physician called more than 250 specialists seeking to refer a hypothetical patient who was partially paralyzed, used a wheelchair, and weighed 200 pounds. The responses by the specialists to the referral request were disturbing. Fewer than 10% of the specialists had the appropriate equipment and trained staff to provide care for the patient. And 20% refused to even book an appointment. Other sources confirm that people with disabilities continue to face pervasive problems of access when they seek medical care. Now the examples I've described illustrate how biases have colored the history of and still persist within the health and medical systems in the United States. The healthcare system often remains a space that many people with disabilities perceive as neither welcoming nor supportive. They attribute that perception, at least in part, to both anecdotal and empirical evidence that many doctors hold negative views of disabled life. There are several studies that reveal physicians' estimations of, disab of disabilities' negative impact on the quality of a person's life as diverging from self-reported experiences by people with disabilities. In other words, doctors who are asked about the quality of life that patients with disabilities can be expected to enjoy tend to estimate the quality as being low, even though people with disabilities typically report a quality of life that rivals that of non-disabled people. As a result, doctors may underestimate the value that a disabled patient will realize from treatment that is able to address a medical problem but that doesn't fix the person's disability. Moreover, physician judgments that incorporate negative assumptions about disability's impact on a person's life, for example, the assumption that disabled people you know, can't be sexually active, those assumptions can negatively affect a patient's health. Physicians' incomplete and skewed understanding of the lived experience of disability results in part from a lack of education. Medical training hasn't traditionally devoted attention to providing trainees with balanced information about the experience of living with a disability. As a result, societal biases are permitted to provide the basis for many doctors' understanding of disability. In addition, a lack of disability-oriented training may leave physicians ill-equipped to meet the full range of health-related needs that people with disabilities have. So, like members of the general public, uh, many doctors may not know a lot about what it's like to live with a disability. But many people in the disability community believe that physicians are keenly aware of the financial costs associated with providing supports and care for people with disabilities. A concern commonly voiced by members of the disability community is that decisions about their medical care, and particularly decisions about discontinuing treatment, may be influenced by resource constraints. Now, America has generally not been willing to embrace overt systems of rationing medical care. A notable exception was Oregon's effort in the early 1990s to devise a rationing system as part of its Medicaid program. Oregon's original rationing plan was rejected, though, by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services on the grounds that it conflicted with the Americans with Disabilities Act. What the proposed scheme did is it had as its central criterion for covering medical services was the comparative benefit that the treatment for different conditions would provide for Oregon's population. And Oregonians' responses to survey questions about what they would count as a benefit fed into the calculation of comparative benefit. In short, Oregon was prepared to ration medical care received by its Medicaid population based partly on the perceptions of non-disabled persons 
about the benefit of living with a disabling condition. In rejecting Oregon's application for a Medicaid waiver, permitting it to implement its rationing scheme, the Secretary of Health and Human Services wrote, the record regarding the manner in which the list of condition treatment pairs was compiled contains considerable evidence that it was based in substantial part on the premise that the value of the life of a person with a disability is less than the value of the life of a person without a disability. This is a premise that is inconsistent with the ADA. The federal government's recognition of this rationing scheme's discriminatory nature encouraged members of the disability community, but it really did little to reassure them um, that medical decisions wouldn't continue to incorporate the same sorts of judgments. Instead, the concern that medical choices for people with disabilities often reflect implicit biases and covert rationing is a frequent refrain in writing by people with disabilities. And here, I think, is a good place to circle back to the two articles that were published within the past six months that I told you about at the beginning of my talk, because they illustrate why these concerns remain vivid today. Although the Department of Health and Human Services told the state of Oregon 25 years ago that rationing schemes premised on the lower value of disabled lives are illegal, the same department is being asked today to make the same point to transplant centers that have continued to discriminate against persons with cognitive impairments. And medical researchers continue to think that it's valuable to ask people who are ill, but who don't have the experience of living with disability, to ask them whether they think it would be preferable to die than to experience different states that many people with disabilities live with for years or decades, such as using a wheelchair, being incontinent, or requiring assistance with breathing. The concern that medical decisions for people with disabilities will incorporate biases against disabled life as being of low value and burdensome arise not only in the context of decisions made by doctors, though. It extends as well to choices made by family members acting as surrogates for patients who are incompetent to make their own decisions. Indeed, People with disabilities themselves may consider the cost of their care as one reason for choosing to discontinue life-sustaining medical treatment. Now, hearing that point, that people with disabilities may take this into account themselves, many bioethicists and some members of the disability community emphasize the importance of ensuring that um, people with disabilities are empowered to make autonomous decisions about their medical care. Respected voices from the disability community argue that equal respect for people with disabilities demands their ability to choose for themselves whatever factors they might rely on. Others in the disability community, however, are less sanguine about the primacy of autonomy. While not necessarily diminishing or dismissing the value of autonomy in the abstract, they question whether the choices that people with disabilities face in fact, resemble the idealized notion of autonomous choice. These concerns are particularly salient for persons disabled by a sudden trauma who must abruptly transition from being able-bodied to facing severe impairments. Expressions of desire to withdraw life-sustaining treatment or even to pursue affirmatively life-ending um, measures in the period following the disabling event aren't unusual. Millions of Americans watched the fictionalized accounts of such a scenario in the closing scenes of the 2005 award-winning movie, Million Dollar Baby. In that movie, the young boxing champion Maggie suffers an injury that leaves her paralyzed and dependent on a ventilator, and she persuades her trainer to end her life. The disability communi community roundly condemned Million Dollar Baby as filled with inaccuracies about life with spinal cord injuries and as portraying Maggie's life of being of such low quality that it wasn't worth living. In the real world, many persons who have suffered disabling injuries have shared their gradual shift in perspective from wishing for death in the aftermath of the injury to discovering satisfaction in their life with disability. This common, although clearly not universal, adaptation to the changed circumstances and the renewed desire to live 
lead many in the disability community to question how truly autonomous is anyone's wish to die in the short term following an injury. Moreover, disability advocates highlight the importance not just of time, but of appropriate supports and accommodations in permitting satisfaction with life with a disability. Society's failure to consistently provide people with disabilities the supports they need to live independently in the community and the accommodations that they need in order to pursue education, employment, and social and civic engagement, they shape the context in which people with disabilities make medical treatment decisions. A paradigmatic case informing the disability view was David Rivlin's. While he was young, David Rivlin suffered an accident. He was surfing, and it um, left him quadriplegic. But for some time after his accident, he lived in the community. He attended community college, and he got engaged. But an operation 15 years after his original injury left him further disabled and dependent on a ventilator. At that point, he tried to continue living in the community, but the level of funding that he could receive for personal attendance wasn't sufficient to let him do so. So he had to live in an institution for which the state paid in full. Believing he had no prospect of living other, any other life other than living in the institution for the rest of his life, then Rivlin sought and received approval from a court to have his ventilator disconnected. 18 years after his original injury. Now viewed from the disability perspective, Rivlin's decision to disconnect his ventilator was not the predictable result of a spinal cord injury and ventilator dependence. Instead, it was the product of the societal devaluation of life with disability that underpins policies segregating and isolating disabled people in institutions rather than supporting their independent living. His choice to disconnect his ventilator and die, they suggest, shouldn't be seen as an exercise of the kind of idealized autonomy that bioethicists may extol. Now, my points so far are not novel, right? Members of the disability community have been raising them in one form or another for decades. Yet too often discussions of ending life decisions fail to engage these concerns seriously and in a sustained fashion. Why have disability concerns not achieved greater traction in these discussions? Do they just not make much sense to the physicians, bioethicists, and lawyers who tend to dominate these discussions? Or do the concerns seem somehow overwrought, failing to acknowledge the strength of the legal protections that are formally accorded to persons with disabilities to protect them from abuse? From the perspective of the disability community, the mainstream folks just don't get it when it comes to disability concerns about ending life decisions. I'm gonna describe now two parallels that I see between the concerns of the disability community around care terminating decisions and the concerns of the African American community around policing in hopes that drawing attention to these parallels might bring home disability concerns in a different way. And I'll be the first to say that these parallels are not exact, and I don't have time here today to flesh them out fully, but I offer them here in hopes that they might make the disability perspective um, more accessible, shall we say, um, to, to some of you. Over the past few years, we have watched media coverage of repeated instances of African American men and boys often unarmed, being shot and killed by police. We've also seen the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement and other um, responses seeking to shine a light on systemic racism in the criminal justice system. As a result, many Americans have become familiar with concepts like implicit bias and white privilege and have come to appreciate the justifiable fear of police harassment and violence that is second nature for many African Americans. Compared to five years ago, I'd wager that today, many more white Americans at least have begun to get it when it comes to issues of race and criminal justice. 
my inspiration for looking for parallels between the points that the Black Lives Matter movement makes and the disability perspective on ending life decisions comes from writing by a man named William Peace. Peace is an anthropologist and a disability rights advocate who uses a wheelchair in his extensive writing about disability and bioethics bioethics, he draws on his own experience and the experience of other people with disabilities about their experiences with the healthcare system. And he writes of the suspicion and fear with which many people with disabilities view the healthcare system. He writes, most people with a disability fear even the most routine hospitalization. We don't fear any of the commonplace indignities those without a disability worry about when hospitalized. Our fear is primal. We're, will our lives be considered devoid of value? And peace is not unique in expressing a fear of the healthcare system. This refrain pervades the literature on disability concerns around ending life decisions and particularly concerns regarding physician assisted suicide. Now, when I read this, peace's description immediately made me think of similar statements about fears of police violence against men of color. A news analysis published following the um, July 2016 shooting of an unarmed black man who was lying on the ground with his hands in the air described the shooting as illustrating the long-standing fear among black men that almost any encounter with police can go awry with potentially deadly results, even when a person follows every law enforcement command. The parallels between blacks' fear of being physically harmed or killed by police violence and disabled people's fears of being physically harmed or killed by a physician's treatment, those parallels are striking to me. In each case, members of a profession charged with advancing safety or health are feared by a subset of the population. Commentators have posited that harmful actions by police or by physicians often flow from misperceptions and implicit bias rather than from overt racism or ableism. The suggestions by these commentators are that police may be more likely to use lethal force against black men because of culturally prevalent perceptions of dangerousness and criminality, and that doctors may be more likely to advise against life-sustaining treatment for people with disabilities because of culturally prevalent perceptions of burdensomeness and hopelessness. In many ways, the contexts of the two professionals' decisions are markedly different, right? But both police officers and physicians often have to make decisions quickly while relying on ambiguous or incomplete information. And those are circumstances that increase the risk of bias influencing judgments. To be clear, people with disabilities don't generally assert that doctors are out to get them. Disability studies scholar Carol Gill refutes that characterization as a straw man fallacy that obscures the true nature of disabled people's concerns. The problem lies not in physician animus, but instead in attitudes that are widespread among medical professionals that underestimate the quality of life with disability, that fail to appreciate options available for increasing functionality and independence, and that reflect heightened sensitivity to health care costs. Gill writes, quote, we are, in fact, much more frightened by the doctors who are out to help us, but who see our lives as burdensome and who know little about topics that make life with disability valuable. We know that their misplaced pity and pessimism is reinforced by the medical institutions that surround them, the policies that guide them, a healthcare system that rewards them for holding down costs, and the prevailing culture that influences their thinking about disability. Certainly, some members of the disability community might not accept the parallels I identify here today and might honestly disclaim any distrust in or fear of their doctors. The fact that this distrust isn't universal, however, doesn't undermine its authenticity or validity of the widely expressed concerns. So in just a, the last few minutes I have here, I'll talk about a, a second parallel that, I'll see, that I see, and then I'll be happy to open it up for questions. And this second parallel that I see 
has to do with the importance of privilege. Um, when we look at the parallels in the literature presenting disabled people's concerns about ending life decisions and points made by racial justice advocates. Now, in the racial justice context, white privilege refers to a set of unearned advantages that white people, like me, um, benefit from, often unconsciously, simply by virtue of our skin tone and that function to perpetuate racial, racial hierarchy. The concept is by no means universally recognized uh, or accepted, but conversations about white privilege have become common over the past several years in settings ranging from universities to church congregations. And I think that openness to white privilege or recognizing white privilege seems to have increased as media coverage of police shootings um, and the movement for black lives have exposed people across groups um, to discussions about racial disproportionality in the criminal justice system. Just as the unearned advantages conferred by skin tone may be invisible to white people, at least until we make an effort to become aware of them, so, too, the unearned advantages conferred by an able body and intact cognitive functioning are often invisible to non-disabled people. Although less widely recognized than white privilege, feminist and disability scholars and activists have discussed the existence and effects of ability privilege or able bodied privilege. According to one commentator, able-bodied privilege allows non-disabled people to maintain experience of superiority perfectibility, security, and comfort. But able-bodied people have not earned the privilege that accompany having, having an able body. And most able-bodied people, frankly, will not retain that status throughout their lives. The privilege of being abled rather than disabled is particularly relevant to the dynamics of the debate around a physician-assisted suicide. Proponents of a right to physician-assisted suicide typically stress how recognizing that right would further the ideals of autonomy, liberty, and control. How their own ability, privilege, affects which values they prioritize, however, probably aren't clear to them. This lack of awareness of how privilege influences perspective makes it more difficult for beneficiaries of ability privilege to appreciate the perspectives of, non, of unprivileged persons as equally valid. According again to Carol Gill, many of the key spokespersons in favor of assisted suicide are familiar with ideals such as independence, control, and freedom because they're by and large from the dominant sector of society that has had access to those experiences. They've enjoyed a good deal of control in their lives, know exactly what they have to lose, and are determined to retain it until death. Unfortunately, viewing the world from a position of privilege may limit one's insight into the consequences of a policy change whose greatest impact would fall on socially marginalized groups. So ideally recognizing the existence and impact of ability privilege in discussions about ending life decisions would encourage a greater openness to the validity of the perspectives that disabled people offer on the subject. Just as white people in America increasingly recognize that people of color often face a different reality in their interactions with the police, non-disabled people could recognize that people with disabilities often face a different reality in their interactions with the healthcare system. Beyond matters of perspective, however, Recognizing the existence of ability privilege also reveals how raw political power lurks in the background of discussions about ending life decisions. Just as racial justice advocates assert that white privilege serves to reinforce racial hierarchies deeply rooted in our society, disability activists point to ability privilege as entrenching social, economic, and political structures that exclude people with disabilities. In short, when disability advocates challenge the mainstream um, bioethicists, the priority that mainstream bioethicists place on choice and autonomy in medical decisions about ending life, they're attempting to wrest power from those bioethicists. As Stephen Drake wrote on the Not Dead Yet blog, criticizing the dominance that the bioethics community has exercised over discussions of end of life policy, at the core, this is a political struggle over public policy, 
a struggle between those who have power and seek to hold on to it, and those directly affected by the policies who want to take power. From the perspective of disability advocates, bioethicists, doctors, and lawyers have for too long had the power to set the terms of discussions about practices that primarily affect people with disabilities. This power to frame policy debates provokes disability activists to demand, once again, nothing about us without us. And while mainstream bioethicists may maintain their neutrality and objectivity in setting the terms of the discussion, they rarely acknowledge how their invisible ability privilege affects their framing of discussion. So I'll, I've got a little bit more that I could say, but I want to stop in time um, to save time for questions. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. So somebody better ask questions or I'll just keep talking. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, that was incredibly informative. And my question has to do with sort of the parallels it seems like you could draw between, um, in some ways, the way that the police are uh, being trained, right, to recognize implicit bias and whether there has been any movement or advocacy for doctors to be trained to say, this is not sort of a statistical medical decision. Yeah, no, great question. And, and there is movement in that direction, right? So. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a real movement in uh, medical education and training around cultural competency. And, and so I've, I've also done some work looking at kind of disability culture and disability cultural competency. And there is some movement towards that, but, but there's still not widespread recognition of kind of disability as a um, group that should be included in those kinds of discussions. So I, I see positive movement in that direction and there's increasing um, conversation in the medical literature about the need for better education. And if you start, if you look at um, medical school curricula, there is more emphasis on um, patients with disabilities, but there's not always, and this is one of my key points, and it's not mine alone by any means, um, there's not always a lot of inclusion of people with disabilities in actually designing and implementing and teaching that. Yeah. Hi, thank you Hi. very much. Uh, I teach a course here, cheerfully entitled uh, Dying in the Law. So this is a subject <laughs> we talk about a lot. Uh, I'm just curious, we talk a lot about the tension between palliative care and assisted suicide and, and doctors like uh, Gawandri and, and Ira Bryak and people like that who are I wonder to what extent this discrimination against uh, people with disabilities carries over into the palliative care world, if you feel there's discrimination there too, or since the mission of palliative care is, is to relieve suffering no matter what, it, 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 that doesn't enter there at all. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't have a, a specific answer to your question in terms of knowing about conversations within palliative care specifically. I do know that, that one of the real concerns um, voiced by people within the disability community is uh, a concern that they will be too quickly pushed towards. Um, and with palliative care, my understanding is that it's not so much of a, a choice like hospice where you're saying I'm giving up the right to curative treatment and focusing um, purely on comfort care and that palliative care can work side by side with curative efforts. But I do know that there is you know, some reluctance towards being steered, as it were, towards one path that um, seems to say, okay, it's time to let go, right? And in, fa in fact, the quote that I gave you from um, William Peace came from an experience that he had where he was, you know, he's used a wheelchair for decades and he was admitted to the hospital with, with a bad infection that was unrelated to his uh, 
his disability, but he had a bad infection. He was being treated aggressively, but at, at 2 a.m. one morning, a doctor came in and had a conversation with him about whether he wanted to pursue just comfort care, right? And, and his point was that if I were not a person with a disability, no doctor would have ever had that conversation with me. So I think there is still that concern about doctors, and of course, it's not the doctor's decision to make, but the advice that a doctor or another healthcare provider or a family member provides can affect decisions. Lovely. Um, this is partly a question and partly a comment. So I, w I was struck by the fact that your talk blends together parallels with social groups and how um, there's been a lot of discussion in the media lately about how we have big political movements happening, but they sometimes seem fractured, right? So there's the Women's March, but does that include Black Lives Matter? And, um, and so I was struck by how you sort of paralleled two social groups and whether or not that practice could be more beneficial for outside of the context of um, end of life um, and whether you might think about uh, paralleling these disability interests with other groups besides the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point and just a couple of observations. One is, um, you know, uh, and I just barely mentioned it in my talk, a lot of the writing about uh, kind of disability studies around end of life decision making has been influenced by feminist mm -hmm. um, scholarship. Mm -hmm. so, so the awareness of, of bodily differences and how those give rise to um, right. system, systemic discrimination. Um, you know, there's a lot of intersection there as well. The other thing that I have found really interesting, and I didn't touch on it in the talk, but that I became aware of as in preparing the paper, is that there's actually a lot of intersection as well, right? So, you know, uh, some of you may know that the um, Washington, D.C. just approved a physician-aided dying measure, as allowing uh, physician-assisted suicide. And one of the groups in terms of the voting populace that, that um, at least based on what I've read, was concerned about those issues was the African American community. We, the same concern that you know we'll, we will be steered because people don't want to spend resources to preserve our lives. We will be steered towards physician-assisted suicide. So, so there are similar concerns there. And as well, there was a report that came out just this past year that estimated that um, a third to a half of people who are killed in police encounters have disabilities, primarily mental disabilities, and there's probably a big overlap between African Americans with mental disabilities who are killed. But but so there's, you know, it's it's not just that they're parallels, at some points they're actually right side by side. And so I think those are I think those are all points that are worth more explanation, so I have a lot more lots more work ahead of me. Oh do it. Thank you. Um, one of the things I noticed that you said too was um, it was about the overtness of discrimination. And I think uh, what I've encountered too throughout my years or like just schooling, high school, whatever, that when you approach certain things like discrimination, a lot of people, they get caught up on like the overtness of it. So like did they say this or did they do this specific thing? But I think a lot of people get, they ignore the microaggressions where like my brother has Down syndrome, and even then I I used to be like one of those people who would say like you know like you're retarded or you're things like that. And then you know one day one of my when I, I had my brother and my friend said something to me about Down syndrome, I was like yeah that's not really funny and you know, things like that. How do you think you should address people when it comes to like microaggressions and stuff like that, and not the overtness, not the something that's just in your face and the yeah. little things that fly by. Yeah, you know, that's really tough because um, I think, you know, and this is something that I struggle with as a, as a teacher as well, um, it, because to the extent that you highlight um, the fact that the way someone has said something or what they've said actually is likely to be perceived by someone in the group they're talking to as, a, as being invalidating yeah. or as being um, devaluing or de demeaning, um, there's always the danger of, putting up defenses so much that you don't get through to the person, 
And so, you know, just, and all, you know, I'm always open to good ideas on this point. So if you have any, I'd love to hear them. But, but what I try to do is, is to really personalize it because one of the reasons I'm so interested in these topics is because they really cause me to look at parts of myself yeah. that I struggle with and try to understand them better. So, you know, sometimes I'll try to say, you know, this is, this is how I used to say things in the past, and, and I realized that it sent a message that I didn't really want to send. Yeah. And so it, it's about how I can recognize something and not telling somebody, you need to change, or you're doing something yeah. that's bad. So I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any advice? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think it's kind of like you said, you got to like look at yourself. Because I think being black, as a black man especially, but like I notice the discrimination and the microaggressions and things like that. But at the same time, I'm, s I'm a man. And I do know that there are certain things I'll do or say sometimes that I'll have to like, I'll even think about it instantly if somebody may call me out because as being a guy, I don't really have to think about it. I don't have to, like cat calling and stuff like that. Like, um, so. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but like, I feel like a lot of people, because one of the things me and my friends would do is not cat calling, but like we'd be in a car yelling at people or whatever. <laughs> and um, but my girlfriend brought up, like, you may not be catcalling, but think about how uncomfortable the girl feels when it's happening every day. You right. don't even care right. that's what they're talking about, if they're directly talking to you, but it's the fact that it's happening. Right. So right. I think that's And you don't want to make people feel bad. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's one of those things you got to look out for. Yeah. No, thank you for that question. No Thanks. problem. Okay. So. Jamie, do you want to do one? Oh, okay. Thank you.